Thank you, sir. All right, so um, welcome to Advancing Trust in AI's inaugural event. My name is Pamela Gupta, and on behalf of the VCS Trusted AI Affiliate Group, I'd like to thank our panelists and attendees for spending time with us on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. As the founder of the group, my vision is to help identify existing resources and provide guidance on building trust in AI. Also to initiate important dialogues that identify risks and dialogues that lead to actions for common good. We are a group of leaders and practitioners from various industries and we'll be hosting monthly events and more frequent dialogues, uh, you know, online, for example, to highlight areas of concern and risk around AI. On a personal note, I came to the US with a degree in psychology to pursue a master's in AI. In my first job, I built an, um, I built an expert system to design smart houses and eventually went into cybersecurity. Last 20 years, I've been creating actionable risk-based cybersecurity strategic programs. One such area is secure development of systems. I built out several holistic programs that took a risk-based approach to integrating security and privacy from conception to delivery in design of systems and delivery of systems. By the way, the expert system I built was sold off to Westinghouse. A few years ago, I realized we were talking how critical and an important part AI systems were playing in accomplishing tasks that conventional systems couldn't perform, but there wasn't a audible and a discernible talk about how to build these systems securely. AI systems have a much more complex development life cycle, as you can imagine, from conventional systems. So as to address this gap, I created a model that takes a holistic approach to building AI systems with trust. It's called AI SPIT, as in security, privacy, integrity, and transparency. Security and privacy are obvious. By integrity, I'm talking about integrity of algorithms to include things such as ethics and lack of you know, diversity, et cetera. We have to take a holistic approach to building AI systems with trust because these are complex systems and unlike system, we cannot go back and add components. Example, um, we've heard about Amazon's recruiting tool, which had gender bias, and they tried to tweak it to eliminate it a bit, but couldn't do that because these are very complex systems again, and they had to scrap the system. There's also the example of Alphabet, Google's parent company, Sidewalk Project in Toronto, which was aborted due to issues with ethics and cost upwards of $50 million. So we have to do it right at the beginning. And also we cannot realize the full potential of AI without building trial AI. And we want to do that. We cannot achieve the intended outcomes without building trust in AI. So very briefly, AI is a lot more than machine learning, which is the most pervasive aspect of AI that we see in our everyday world today. Three areas are sense, where you're talking about computer vision and audio processing. Comprehend area, which is natural language processing, for example, knowledge representation, uh, as in speech analytics, cognitive robotics, etc., as well as act uh, area, which is where machine learning and expert systems come under. Why do we need to address trust in AI? Very briefly, as we know, AI holds tremendous promise. Economic impact of AI will be measured in trillions of dollars. And it is positioned to be the largest contributor to global economy in the next 10 years, raising global GDP by around 12 to $15 trillion. It's a, set to be uh, the only technology in this realm of being a key source of transformation, disruption, and competitive edge in today's fast-changing economy. So clearly the promise and impact of AI transcends any other technology 
But there is a reverse side of that, and that is the complexity and the risk and the uncertainty that these systems come with. And also, it has huge potential for pitfalls. Why? Because primarily due to the fact that AI systems are taking bigger decisions, bigger decision-making uh, taking role in more industries without oversight, with virtually no government oversight. Private companies are using AI software to make determinations about health and medicine, employment, credit worthiness, and even criminal justice. So there's an example of a compass system, but I won't go into that because we don't have time. Without having to answer for how they're ensuring that these programs are being built consciously or unconsciously um, without, uh, without structural biases. Michael Sander, the political philosopher says, AI represents three major areas of ethical concern for society, privacy and surveillance, bias and discrimination, and perhaps the deepest, which is a philosophical question of the uh, role of human judgment. EU uh, has defined ethics uh, guidelines for trustworthy AI, and we will have a different session based and go more into that. But at a very um, high level, trustworthy AI in their definition has three components, which could be met throughout the system's entire life cycle. It should be lawful, it should be ethical, and it should be robust, both from a technical and social pr perspective, which is one of the aspects that I mentioned in uh, my spit model, for example. Today's fo uh, focus, we have two sessions today, and they're focused on the ethics in AI. In the first session, I will be talking with Colonel Barnes, who is the Chief AI Ethics Officer at US Army. And in the second session, Irene will talk to Dr. Madiha Jaffrey from our group. So without further ado, let's go in to the first session. According to a 2019 Gallup poll, Americans trust the US military more than any other public institution, as they have for two decades. So for our inaugural event, we thought we would start with a conversation with the US Army Chief of Ethics. Welcome, Colonel Barnes. Could you please introduce yourself to the audience? A absolutely, thank you very much, uh, Pamela, and to the entire Advancing Trust in AI group. Uh, it is really an honor to be here and speak with you today uh, in an area that I'm very passionate about. And I know every member of this group shares that same passion. Um, as a brief disclaimer, uh, obligatory, right? Uh, what I will provide are my own opinions and do not necessarily reflect those of the Department of Defense, the United States Army, or the United States Military Academy. Okay, now that's out of the way. I'm an odd duck in a sense. I wear two major hats and serve two major functions for the Army. Uh, as, as Pamela mentioned, uh, as the Chief AI Ethics Officer working through uh, the Army's uh, AI Task Force, soon to be Center, and Futures Command. The second is I am Professor and Deputy Head of English and Philosophy Department at the United States Military Academy at West Point. So much of what I think about this problem space is motivated by working with and teaching the young men and women that will soon be leading our Army and, and, and different aspects of our nation in the future and how to best prepare them for this very exciting but also uncertain future. And so um, hopefully that's a good introduction and I and can't wait for our conversation, Pamela. So Colonel, I wanted to ask you a few questions. Um, the first one is, what is your perspective on trusted AI? Namely, who are the stakeholders and what are the objectives do they vary by the stakeholders, the objectives? Do they vary by the stakeholders, for example? So, so first off, I, I, not to add to a disclaimer, but just so that everyone understands part of the position I come from, I'm an analytical philosopher by background, right? So a precise definitions matter to me very much so. And I think it'll be a recurring theme in our, in our discussion today, how sometimes uh, different stakeholders bring their own particular worldview to this problem space. And even uh, what a simple uh, a phrase like 
trust in AI or trustworthy AI has different perspectives depending on where you sit. For example, um, the, the deputy commander of Futures Command has asked a question to a number of us. He said, um, how do we ensure that soldiers will trust th this new technology? But if you think about it, is he asking that question, is he using word trust in the same way that we're talking about potentially the robustness um, of, 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 of the algorithm of the system itself? Are we talking about um, in terms of the testing, evaluation, validation, verification of, of a particular system? And in a sense, the answer is yes, but it may not be the same. So partly this is informed by, at least my perspective, is that the layperson uses the word trust in, in a way that we, we commonly do when we're talking about interpersonal relationships, right? So do you trust someone to do something? Do you, do you have a trust in, in a particular uh, uh, a group of people, for example? But we also use that word when we say, hey, do you trust your, your, uh, uh, your, your phone or um, uh, you know, a program like Waze, right, to, to get you to the right definition. But it's not exactly clear that we're speaking about trust in the same kind of way, right? Because when we're talking about interpersonal relationships, we're talking about intention, we're talking about dignity and respect of that individual, we're talking about potentially duties that might arise or in beliefs about those duties. When we're talking about another machine, in a sense, a tool, perhaps we ought to think about it in terms of the reliability piece. Right, and the reason why I mention this is, is just last week uh, I was briefing at a, at a conference on autonomous systems for the Department of Defense, and it was very heavy tech focus, um, fully understandable, but in a way they were approaching the problem and from a different perspective and the danger is that we might be talking past each other because both views of trust matter. So when someone says that, you know, uh, this isn't really uh, ethical AI, it's all about safety, or it's all about trust, or it's all about reliability in, in AI. And I, I, I think that those, each of those are necessary to have ethical, responsible AI, but alone are not sufficient, right? So, yeah. <laughs> all right. So, um, related to that then, the Army um, does take a calculated approach to design deployment and um, uh, development of technologies. But AI is different, right? AI is a, a, when it comes to machine learning, for example, it's a black box. So how, how do you uh, deploy AI in the Army? So um, I, the thing about, um, it is not just the Army's approach to, to developing, design, developing, deploying responsible artificial intelligence. I, I think you'll see it you know, in all different sectors, right? The, the focus when people think about the military or the Army is it's going to be how AI may transform the battlefield in some sort of way. But I think the reality is much more complex and expansive than that. AI is already ubiquitous in our lives and will continue to be so. So much of what the Army does is certainly focused on enabling the soldier uh, and the commanders on the battlefield, but it also includes other, perhaps we might group them into back office uh, uh, categories. Uh, for example, how do we look at human resources and talent management? Uh, how do we, in, in a sense, leverage artificial intelligence uh, for predictive maintenance, right? In order to save the taxpayer uh, thousands, potentially millions of dollars to do that in a better way. Um, and, and, you know, can we leverage this technology to assist with, with another role that the military has and in, 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 uh, uh, certainly domestically, but sometimes, you know, at the request overseas for a humanitarian assistance or disaster relief. So there are all different ways that, that, um, the, that we're looking at how to best develop and deploy this, this new technology. Um, and a lot of it though, you know, as you mentioned with this idea of black boxes, a lot of the problems are common. So they're certainly contextual dependent, right? Lethal autonomy is gonna have its own set of concerns, but other concerns, like you mentioned, the EU's notion of ensuring that we have, uh, that it's lawful, that it's, you know, that, it's, uh, that it's robust, right? That it's ethical, apply to uh, a talent management program, as well as it, at even in perhaps an odd way in, in a predictive maintenance program. And when you're talking about um, 
this whole ecosystem of, of information processing systems, right, that spanned all the way from, you know, the narrow AI, the early expert systems, design trees, et cetera, to, to now the future cutting edge, uh, deep learning, uh, you know, and, and, and generative uh, systems, et cetera. Uh, there is this notion that because we're going to rely on these systems to process that information in a much rapid way um, in order to leverage its promise, we still want to have an understanding of how it's arrived at the decisions that it made. And by definition, a learning system is going to be a different system the day that you deploy it, unless you freeze it. Right. And this raises the, a whole new um, area of concern for those involved in a testing evaluation of, of, of these new systems. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, so speaking of building ethics in systems, right? It is a challenge and um, it may not, all the nuances of that may not be that well understood. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what are uh, the myths around AI ethics and building it into machine learning systems and AI systems? I, I, absolutely. So um, I, I think one of the, 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 the problems with ethics and anyone in involved in, a, in, the, in, a, in an AI life cycle, whatever sort of mental construct that you have of that. I think no one desires, right, to, to be unethical or to make unethical decisions and part of their work. But we have this a tendency, and I'm as guilty as, as everyone, to sort of presume that it's somebody else's responsibility, right? That somebody else will be looking that, whether it's a compliance issue at the end, whether it's a legal review before the system is fielded. And I think that, you know, everyone involved in the process has, has a, a particular role. Now, here's some of the myths. One of the first ones is that these aren't ethical decisions, right? In particular, when we're talking about uh, building and employing uh, a, an AI-enabled system to do something, say, not related to the battlefield, right? Um, there, there's this idea that, it, that it's not really an, an ethical uh, decision. But we have to remember that whether we're talking about the safety of a system or the robustness of the system, if our decisions in that life cycle impact the lives of, of, of humans, at a minimal, that is a values-laden decision, right? And it might be more expansive if we take into consideration the environment, for example, right? You know, what, what is the carbon uh, cost going to be for, for, for training these algorithms, as an example? Another one is that, is that AI is values neutral. Well, the, the math is objective. I, I lead it, you know, when I teach this in a class, I'll, I'll write two plus two on the board, and I'll say, all right, what is the, the, the moral value of this statement? And I get a little chuckle. And, and, you, and you hear people that, that, that um, and, and, and I'm sure I'm not alone, and people, other people on this call have, have heard this before, as well, that's just math and math is, is values neutral. And, and it is true. But even uh, the, 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 the most conscientious data scientist who's working to optimize code may right, unconsciously think of that optimization as, as a good, right? It's something she's striving to, wants to achieve. But the reality is that decision, right, um, may affect other people, as I mentioned before, but it's also one good about, of, of, of many, right? And if we're taking the, the impacts of, of each of those decisions, it needs to go that way. Um, and then the last one, which is really a big one, and, and we, it'll, I think it'll span further in our conversation, is this notion that we can just simply code ethics into an, a system. So let's set aside um, that, 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 you know, the assumption that we haven't agreed upon uh, acceptance of a universal normative theory. And there's an assumption that we can then take that theory and simply encode it into a, into a system. Even if that's possible, or even if you can bound the system in, the, in certain ways, it might be behaving ethically, but that doesn't mean that it's an ethical system, right? It is, it is only operating within the bounds you set, right? And right. again, when you're talking about any of this technology, it's about the technology and, and the human uh, user, right? The human is so critical throughout the, the life cycle process, including uh, uh, when it's employed in, in, in the real world. And even a system that's designed fully ethically could be actually employed in the field for, for, for reasons that are either illegal and, and unethical as well. And there, there's, there's many more. So. Right, right, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yes, I agree. And it goes back to that question of what are those checks and balances that we put around the system 
And also our ethics reflect through in the way we are encoding um, these algorithms. I read a, uh, I heard a very interesting talk uh, on whose ethics and how they're uh, related to the, the times that we're in, because they do take, uh, they change by so many factors, including what was unethical a um, few years ago, maybe ethical now, for example. So that, that agility of those systems of how we coding the ethics and the algorithms, that's, that's really important. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Colonel, I read a book called Unrestricted Warfare, Switching Topics. Now, switching is slightly. Uh, it's, uh, it's a book by two uh, Chinese military um, strategists uh, who, are, who are exploring strategies that militarily and politically disadvantaged countries uh, might take in order to successfully launch attacks against co countries like the US, for example, uh, they, particularly. They talk about the military doctrine, which is led by um, technology. And they argue that that creates a dynamic that is a crucial weakness in the uh, American military. So now we're talking about AI, which is a, a complex area and less than, it's not a linear kind of a program. It's not, it's, it's hard to predict outcomes, for example. So we're talking about complex technology. Combine that, that with China, for example, has the most ambitious AI uh, strategy right now for when it comes to AI out of all the nations. And they're using to monitor and control its own population, for example, in addition to using AI to, for military purposes. Um, there's also a major general, Alexis Grankovic, who talks about the emerging digital liberal democracy in the United States digital hybrid regime in Russia and the digital authoritarian uh, regime in China. So the question I have for you is if the US is building AI ethically, will AI ethics put us at a disadvantage if our adversaries don't take a principled approach? No, it's, 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 a, fan, it's a fantastic question. And, and, but, and the thing to remember, and I wanna share everyone in the audience is, is that is that the army is going to design, develop, and deploy, uh, you know, AI-enabled systems like any other uh, 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 technology in accordance with our nation's values and the rule of law. Um, and 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 what's key to that is that our actions, not only on the battlefield, if that's something that we have to do, right, to to, to defend our, our country, um, but even further back, all the way back through the, the entire life cycle of a new technology, we are informed in, by the law of armed conflict, by our, our nation's laws and by, and by the treaties. Those law of armed conflict are, are grounded in, in the just war theory and the principles that um, you know, a, 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 a weapon system or, or a, a soldier may not intentionally target a non-combatant or civilian, non-combatant in law, you know, a civilian and innocent in, in, in the, uh, uh, more in the, in the philosophical term. And the other is this, this notion of proportionality, that we ought not use force that exceeds um, the good, you know, the benefit that occur and, term, and the harm. So this gets into notions of, of collateral damage. And these are very key elements, right? So some have postured, even outside the, the, the realm of technology, right? That, that even just following these sort of morally informed laws in a sense might proverbially tie our hand behind our back in how we operate. And, and quite frankly, I, I think that that is false. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's false for a number of reasons. One is that our, our nation expects us to, to, to do the right thing. I know it's, 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 a, it's a simple phrase, but uh, you know, one of the reasons we are one of, you know, cons consistently one of the most trusted organizations is because um, they can place that trust in us that we will um, you know, if called upon, win on the battlefield, but do it in accordance with the law of armed conflict and, and the just war theory. A another one is this, this technology will actually allow um, our soldiers, our commanders on the battlefield to be able to be better at distinguishing combatants and non-combatants. It would actually allow us, right, 
uh, to, in a sense, to, to prevent uh, much more collateral, uh, collateral damage, right? It's going to enable the decision-making in a timely manner, right? Because so often this unforgiven minute that we talk about um, occurring, um, when, 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 when things are going really wrong and, 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 the, and the soldier, uh, she has to make a snap judgment, right? To be better informed, to have better uh, technology will, will assist in that. So the question then is, certainly there's, there's, there's this notion that we, we have to follow the law. Is, is, is a potential adversary gonna take advantage of that? The answer is, of course they will. I mean, this, this, this is not, you know, it, the nations, the major nations all profess to follow the law of armed conflict and, 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 and just war theory. Um, but we have to be prepared for uh, uh, responding to others that may not follow those same precepts, right? They're not motivated that same way. So there may be those windows, right? Um, where, you know, one might say that, you know, the, the, the idea of human control of the system or something is so paramount um, that they're going to be able to employ a technology that's going to put us at such a, 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 a disadvantage. Um, and the answer is, currently, that's not the case. We need to ensure that um, we are also um, leaning forward in our research and development um, so that we can maintain a technological edge, but do so that's within our values. Because another uh, concept that, that many don't talk about is, the, is, in a sense, what is the effect of this soldier when she returns home, right? So, in, 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 you know, take, taking another's life is, is something very seriously, and, and there's a potential for, for moral injury. And being able to rely upon a system to help assist with that, right? Th th there, there's no point that, that, that I can foresee that we would ever abandon those, that, that, that moral ground for that. Um, and, and I think that is one of the great advantages that we have, much as the same as, as by having an, an, you know, an inclusive liberal democracy to bring in all those voices, expertise and not to help shape those. So it's a great, great question. Thank you. All right, um, one last question. And that's a question I think uh, that's probably on everybody's mind is on lethal autonomous weapon systems. You know, so aligned with the last question, what are they? Um, so just, I'll just rattle off some questions and you're welcome to just, um, you know, answer all or one of them. What are they? Which countries are using them? And from my research, I've not been able to find international laws governing their use. So what, where does that leave us? Where, where is, you know, does that pose a very a big uh, ethical problem? And um, can you talk to me a little bit about that? A absolutely. So th there's certainly wide concern globally about lethal autonomy. And part of it, I, I believe, quite frankly, is, is informed by things that are in our realm of science fiction. But as Neil deGrasse Tyson said, one of the uh, Defense Innovation Board members, even in the US, there's a lot of fear, not just uh, on, on lethal autonomy, but also about AI taking jobs, et cetera. And we can't, you can't dismiss that, right? I mean, th these are real concerns. Um, and so it's, it's worthwhile to unpack uh, uh, some of the arguments both for and against it. One of the, the um, problems with lethal autonomy, uh, quite frankly, harkens back to a uh, lack of a common definition. Uh, the US, but other countries have had autonomous systems deploying on a battlefield in a variety of degree, a spectrum of autonomy since World War II, right? And um, so some people, when they think about it, they're, they're informed by this notion of, of killer robots, or something like that, the, the Terminator. Um, and, and in a sense, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm of the belief that that, that general uh, artificial intelligence is is way beyond certainly my lifetime. Maybe it's it's it's, it's a bridge too far. But in the meantime, we have to understand that you're going to have and have had autonomous systems, but now you're going to have AI-enabled autonomous systems that are that are going to bring a different uh, sort of degree to it. So some of these concerns quite frankly, can be simply bucketed into two areas. What are the ethical legal concerns when a technology works as advertised, as planned, as designed? And then also, 
what are the ethical and legal considerations when it doesn't work? And I'll call those that other buckets, many of them are they, they technically contingent, right? Because th there are real ethical concerns in both bins, but much of the concern about black boxes or emergent behavior or errors in judgment or errors, uh, for example, on the battlefield, in, in a sense, even if those were corrected, there might be some other ethical legal concerns that are out there. So the definition seems to matter. For, for the US and our, our policy is derived uh, right now from a DOD, DOD Directive 3000.09. It says that um, any of these autonomous systems must maintain an appropriate level of human judgment over the use of force. And internationally, part of the reason that there hasn't been uh, legislation either banning it or, 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 or addressing it that's been widely accepted is the differing views of what a lethal autonomous system might fully entail. So much so that, that recently Bob Work has said, you know, maybe it's not lethal autonomous systems that are the concern, it's fully lethal autonomous systems. Run one that, that you know, select in, independently um, in, in a sense that, that operate, uh, you know, without, um, uh, you know, any, any sort of connection back to, to, to the human. Um, but th those, in a sense, aren't the kind of weapon systems that, that we're really talking about. There's another aspect of it too, is the difficulty in not just defining what weapon system we're referring to, but if there was a, a universal desire to, to prohibit them or ban them, these are different in kind than a more material system, right? They're going to be part of another system, right? They may be involved in the entire process that includes everything from the target recognitions through processing the, the intelligence to be able to, to recommend a target, selecting a weapon system, et cetera, or it could actually be all, all contained in, in one. Um, but you know, unlike another, say, weapon of mass destruction, some people uh, have, have, have claimed that perhaps AI, because it'll be democratized and available uh, so widespread, it might be considered a new one. Um, there are certain material aspects of it that you can regulate and control, like visible like, uh, 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 uranium, for example, right? Okay. Um, here we're talking about the triad of, of, of the algorithm, of the data, and the computing power. And it, you know, I know that's oversimplification maybe, but really perhaps the leverage um, that, that, uh, that, that states have right now is over the computing power, right? The, the ability to do it. Because the algorithms are at a minimal dual use. They can be repurposed. We are still, you know, it's, it's not just the military. I mean, it's across the board. We're developing algorithms from scratch, but we're also dusting off those from the uh, AI winter before and trying to get them to benefit because now we have the computer power, now we have, uh, have the data. Um, right. and, and I might not have touched on all of those uh, uh, great questions, Pamela, but, but I think th this is what makes this space really complex. And again, it's not, not to say that we should ignore it. I mean, there, there are concerns about responsibility and we need to, 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 to settle on how we can ensure that, the, that, it, that a human user is ultimately responsible, right? And there's, there's means to do that. We have to ensure that um, and, and this is, in a sense, something that we could all do, regardless of what industry we, we represent, um, that we don't fill these, uh, deploy these in the world when they're not ready to. to, to right. You know. right. Yeah, so. Right, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of, there's one more question that came in from the audience. I'd like to uh, end with that. Um, how does ethics play a role in building IT infrastructures for AI? For example, when working with vendors, how can the army as a customer and consumer of AI technology influence the vendors who build these products to incorporate ethical principles into their product? So, so as many in the audience know, that the Department of Defense uh, signed, uh, the Secretary of Defense signed off on the DOD AI principles last February, February 2020, responsible, equitable, traceable, reliable, governable. Um, and furthermore, uh, different research organizations, including Harvard's Berkman Klein, have, have looked globally and discovered, at least the last look I had, was 36 major uh, either, either nation states or, 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 or larger organizations have fielded their own sets of principles. They all tend to gravitate and bucket in, into some very common areas, much like DODs. 
but here's the next step of this process, right? How do you take them and operationalize them? And so uh, one way that the Army is looking at doing it and also the Department of Defense is taking those principles, which in a sense are guideposts, and taking a look at internally to our processes, right? So can we look at, as the Department of Defense has moved from waterfall methodology in terms of our software development into more agile design, you know, can we take a look at legal, ethical, uh, policy considerations throughout it, through the sprints of that process. In other words, if we're developing a new weapon system, it certainly has to go through an Article 36 review before it's deployed at the end, but that's too late. As you mentioned, Pamela, we're, we're investing millions and tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars in this space, right? Furthermore, um, why are we waiting that far to, to discover it? Why can't we move that further up into process? And that's gonna require a couple things, right? It's, I think it's gonna require teams of experts working uh, uh, with the, the, the different research projects, right? The, the different system life cycles. But it's also gonna require a, a improved education for everyone that has a touch point in the life cycle of the system so that she could raise the red flag. Yes, you need particular red teams, but you also need everyone to be able to identify what that is. I know, by the way, we have a process for it in, in the military, right? As much as many businesses do, and that's a risk management. Risk management is not sufficient, but it is a methodology Right, where then we can identify what potential problem spaces are and then make a decision on how we're going to mitigate that risk or we're going to move on. And I think that applies to, to ethics as well. So the, the, the DOD, the Jake is working with different vendors to translate these principles down so that we can ensure that those who are going to be working with the DOD um, are, are going to be able to, to, to best fulfill um, uh, the, the requirements that have been mandated by the military in accordance with those principles, um, and and you know, it, right now every company is wrestling with this. All the major tech corporations have their own sets of principles, and they're trying to sort out how to do it. And I think events like this, groups like this that bring people across the spectrum from all these different uh, representative stakeholders, can do a you know a much better job of not just talking about it, but actually getting down and working together on some practical solutions. And I think that if we do that, our way ahead. Uh, is, is going to be very bright. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so what you call actionable, uh, I mean, what you call operation, operationalizing, and I call actionable, really important concepts, you know, from dialogue to action. So that is our mantra. And thank you so much, Colonel Ban. I appreciate having the opportunity to talk to you, uh, ask you questions, and would like to invite you back for a future event. Uh, as we talked about, I think it will be our honor and privilege. Thank you so much. Th thank you very much. It was, it was, it was my honor to, to, to be a part of this and in, in, in particular the, the inaugural event. Um, and I, I definitely look forward to, to any further questions. As you can tell, I love talking about this and I will talk to anybody about it because I think it is vital uh, to, to not just our country, uh, but, but to us as, as, as a people, the future of, of, of us. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So um, now we go to our second session, and we may have taken a little bit more time than um, <laughs> um, we had uh, planned, but th these are really important discussions, really important points, and I'm just glad we are uh, bringing them out to the open and we'll continue to do so. So for our next part of the session, I hand this over to Irene and uh, to Dr. Madiha Jaffrey. Thank you so much, Pamela. And thank you so much, Colonel, Colonel Barnes. You were wonderful. And um, I already have like five questions for you. So I'll find you on LinkedIn. Um, thank you so much for joining. And thank you, my, uh, Dr. Badiha Jaffrey for being here. We're gonna have our session now. And um, I'm just gonna let her introduce herself first. Um, Dr. Jaffrey is a, an associate fellow at Lockheed Martin. So, um, if you don't mind introducing yourself and tell us a little bit about what you're doing at Lockheed Martin. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, and I'm, I'm super exactly. I think uh, it was such a pleasure listening to Colonel Barnes that I, I, I was like, can I can I put my four feet flag? I just want to keep hearing him. Let's let's dedicate the full hour to him. So this was really exciting conversation. <laughs> 
No, uh, I guess, um, so So yeah, I'm, I'm Medea Jaffrey, and, and I guess before we, we get started, the same same disclosure as Dr. Barnes, uh, the, the opinions that I share here today are my own, uh, they, don't, they don't necessarily reflect the policies of Lockheed Martin. Um, so uh, having said that, uh, I've been, um, uh, I got my, my PhD in electrical and computer engineering almost 14 years ago, uh, and, uh, and basically uh, I tackled an electromagnetic uh, propagation problem using artificial intelligence, which was one of the first back in those those days, you know, they, they, you know, we were using a little bit of AI for image recognition, but not necessarily for signal processing. So, so that was something that my my PhD uh, tackled. And then, um, and then for my postdoctorate, I, I worked on my postdoctorate at the same time, and it was uh, to to classify schizophrenia using fMRI and and using artificial intelligence. So again, using you know two very different domains. There's the medical, and then the you know the the engineering, biomedical engineering, and then electrical engineering, but then solving it using a common common solution. So uh, I've been a proponent for AI for again 14 years. It's been a it's been a while. I joined Lockheed Martin uh, in a very different capacity, though. I joined them as a cryptographer. I uh, worked with NSA to just certify a few uh, of our uh, Aegis um, uh, Aegis baselines or uh, the Navy uh, Navy portfolio. And um, and then I've been with them for um, you know for, for 10 years. I basically worked on in cyber security domain and and uh, loved every aspect of it and then after you know since uh, since 2017 with the DoD's emphasis on back on AI with the Jake um, I got I had the the, uh, the the opportunity to jump back into my passion from 14 years ago and and basically now I'm looking at the Lockheed Martin's portfolio and and where we can insert AI but then keeping bringing that cybersecurity um, uh, you know in the forefront and making sure that we do it uh, ethically and with trust so that's just a, a quick background. Awesome, thank you. Um, so, you know, we've talked already here about some of the various areas of, okay, what does it mean, trust in AI, right? Um, you know, there's the privacy aspect, there's the bias aspect, and there's, of course, the, you know, how are we actually applying this? Uh, how many decisions is it making for people, right? Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've been to events like this, and this is generally the focus of it. Um, you know, what does it mean to you? You know, if you were, and coming from this, like, you know, very diverse background, right? Because you're like building, you know, something uh, for, um, you know, the the schizophrenia on one side with the with the psychological, and then you're also doing, you know, uh, the other aspect with the, the image and signal. Um, so, you know, uh, from your perspective, given given that you've come from this kind of interdisciplinary and background, um, you know, what does that mean to you for us to be trusting in AI or increasing trust in AI? Yeah, yeah, that's that's such a good question. And then exactly, we all have our perspectives on that, right? So for me, I love to um, take some of the military uh, uh, language to to explain some of it, right? So in, in the military uh, or in the DoD, we have what, what we call the OODA loop, o -O -O. so O-O-D-A, which basically stands for, um, you know, observe, orient. Uh, decide and act. You know, so it's um, it's it, it's a, a, a military language, but it can be applied to to us. I mean, for example, if you're shopping, right, you observe a, observe an item and then you orient yourself where where is the best price for this item, and then you know you you decide and then you act that okay, this is I'm going to buy it from this store and and I'm going to make the purchase. So so you know the 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 concept of the OODA loop is is really um, across uh, everything in our lives. So um, so I think for me. Uh, AI plays a critical role in the double O part, right? So observe and orient, you know? So I would love for um, automation, more automation to, to help me uh, in that decision process that uh, orient me with all the right uh, data so that when I make that decision, it's, it's the best decision I can make in the, in the situation. So for me, being able to trust that is, is what trust AI means to me. Yeah, and I mean, isn't that, you know, kind of the, the thing with this, right? I mean, if we have access to all this knowledge and all this information, and we have a way to um, empower ourselves and, and use it to make our lives easier in whatever way, right? Knowledge is power. So why wouldn't we? Uh, and, and, you know, this is really the opportunity that AI presents us, right? I mean, for the next decade and for decades to come, we're going to see more and more automation. Um, obviously, we talked a little bit about this in the previous session, but I mean, you know, in your words, like, where do things go wrong, right? Um, at what point is it, uh, is this technology being impacted by, um, you know, human inadequacies in, in whatever capacity? 
Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and yep. I think, um, you know, one of the questions that, that we had on online about, you know, what can, for example, infrastructure do, right? Some, uh, when we talk about AI, people assume that it's just the act of just ML ops, you know, just the, just that little uh, pipeline is all we need to worry about when we talk about trust and ethics, but it's really the big picture, right? Everything matters when it comes to ethics. So I'll give a very simple example, you know, the automation industry, right? Uh, um, in engineering, you know, uh, females are, are definitely a minority. We're still trying to get in there. Um, so, so one thing I'll, you know, I'll share that I'll maybe a uh, few you can resonate with is uh, cars, right? So I've been maintaining my car for almost 20 years. And, you know, when that, when that red light goes on, the, the check engine light, you know, for me, my reaction is much different than maybe my male counterparts, right? Because for me, that little red light means that now I have to trust what the mechanic tells me. And being a female, when I go to the mechanic, we get a completely different bill of list than, than you know, a lot of times what, what my completely clueless male friends would get, right? So, so for me, if I was designing that little red light, I would put some explanation to it, that this sensor is going wrong, this is off, you know, you need to get your filter checked, you don't need your wiper blades changed, you know, so I would want that explainability. So, so when it comes to bias, I mean, we have heard about a lot of different things, but it, it like, so we are not even talking AI right now. We're talking a, a simple red indicator. So if the, the company had enough diversity to, to begin with, you know, when we design a system to have this diversity of thoughts, if there was a female in the group, she would say that this one little red, this is, this is the problem. I want more explanation to this. I want more explainability so that I don't have to rely on, you know, a, a very male centric mechanics uh, mechanic shop, right? So, uh, so I think that's where things go wrong. We, we again, we think that oh, AI is is way out there. Um, you know, well, uh, yes, we need diversity in AI, but but it's not just in AI. It's just the full culture. So, so I think that's where we go wrong. It just, we just have biases that we need to tackle. Yeah, and finding out, you know, like. <laughs> It's funny because in, in a way it's like trying to regulate this industry as it's growing is, is really like such a big challenge, right? Because, um, you know, let's take certain geopolitical, uh, you know, partners and, and um, peers, right? So China has a mandate by 2030 to be an AI leader, you know, but of course it's China, right? So they have a huge country, tons of people's data that they can use, really effective data collection and, you know, a lot of nat national determination to get this done. Um, you know, EU, I see the EU really as a leader in uh, creating privacy laws because, you know, in the, in the US, you know, I feel like we're still in the wild west, you know, there's like, there's that, there's that company, right? Where you can, they can like take a picture of you and then find out where you live, find out information about you. And obviously, you know, that, um, that is one of the more like hot topics, right? But um, there is kind of that notion of like, okay, we're we're really building this regulation as we're building, uh, you know, our level of investment in these in these technologies. Um, so is it enough, really, uh, from your perspective, I guess, to just think about okay, the diversity as far as this the sample, right? Uh, selection bias. Um, you know, we read uh, we read two books recently, uh, Weapons of Math Destruction and uh, Invisible Women. Uh, both are really talking about kind of the, you know, uh, because maybe a lot of the, the uh, you know, examples, right? AI is learning from examples. So if you give it a lot of examples and it's based on the size and body of a man, you know, yes, maybe you'll have more women dying, uh, you know, from, from using their seatbelts, right? Because they're mm -hmm. not designed for that body type, right? It's just one example. Um, so yeah, like, what, what do you think are uh, the limitations, I guess, of increase, this increase in diversity? And um, where should we be most focused on increasing diversity? Yeah, yeah, gosh, you mentioned so many things there. And I would say, you know, like the, the first thing, because that was one related to one of the questions. So, so when we can't talk about diversity, um, you know, and, and we are everybody so, so worried about where China is and what, what they're doing and what, you know, one thing that China doesn't have uh, is diversity. Right. So what we do have is that so we, we just have to cultivate it. Right. We just have to uh, make sure that we like, you know, we don't have to clone people <laughs> and, and try to, you know, make a diversity. Right. We already have it. And, and, you know, same thing with UK. UK has that diversity. They're just ahead in embracing the diversity, I feel. Or, you know, I mean, people can go both ways, but that's the strength of our allies as well. Our allies have that built in diversity that 
um, that you know companies, you know, <laughs> countries like China, Russia may not have. So, so that's that gives me a little bit of peace because um, when it comes to ethics and um, and AI and inserting um, inserting that, it's it's a full it's a full cultural process, you know? So like, it's, like I said, with, with the car, and now you can, if you have a, you know, the, when you build a car and you um, you have diversity in the company, then you add on AI on it, it will, will just make sense. But I think one thing that I like to do is also talk about um, ethics, what used to be, like, you know, what is traditional ethics that we are, we are know of? And then what, uh, what is the ethics that that we mean when we say AI ethics, right? So the traditional ethics that most companies know of is is very much a, a sequential kind of a step. You know, you have ethics, you have a, a group, um, you know, uh, an ethics team, and then you have your engineers. And uh, first, the ethics team just lays out like a training plan that you know uh, you shall not do sexual harassment at work, you shall not have bullying at work, right? And then the engineers listen to that and they try to abide by it. And then sometimes you know there there may be some uh, harassment case, and then they go to the ethics and then the ethics people do their thing and you know so it's a very serial thing right but with AI uh, it's you can't just build an ethics team and then expect it to to do that it's it's you know just just like uh, the colonel said it has to be embedded and so how do you embed it who is going to challenge so so when, let's say you can you can have those principles AI principles and uh, you can say that don't don't build things that are racist or you know that are sexist but then when you have engineers that don't have the diversity pool in there, who who is doing the check as they go back in there on their computers and did they go and develop a product? So so that's where you know it's it's so important to 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 not just have an ethics team standing on the side, like you know having the 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 pillars of uh, explainability, you know uh, AI ethics is important, but then having that diversity laid in to do that checks and balances is something that I think the U.S. and the U.K. We definitely have the advantage of. We just have to cultivate it more, um, and then of course the ex uh, explainability part is super important too. Yeah, and it almost seems like you know even that <laughs> even that feels like it's not enough. You know, uh, like I just think about um, Facebook, right? Like two years ago, what was it? Four years ago, maybe. And and you know, our Congress had no idea how Facebook made money, right? They were like, "How do you guys make money?" And they were like, "Well, we run ads." <laughs> so you know, um, let's take Facebook as an example. You know, they they created a, an AI task force to help battle misinformation, right? Because this was the big issue. It's like if we're constantly misinforming these people and these platforms are not taking the responsibility, uh, then you know nothing's really going to change, right? We we can't even rely on elections really if people are just getting so much misinformation they can't make an, an informed decision, right? So um, so we thought, okay, a uh, you know Facebook will get their slap on the wrist, you know, put a, a task force together and and try to make improvements, right? But here's the conflict. The app is designed to get you hooked on it. You know, it's designed to keep your, um, you know, the KPIs, right? How much airtime, how much screen time. So um, this seems to be like, like you were saying early on, a philosophical uh, discussion really about um, how do you take an app that is designed to uh, have a certain level of engagement from you and, and without there being policy or, you know, an overarching, I don't know, police uh, of, of some type, and maybe it's just legal reper you know, repercussions, right? But that that precedent doesn't exist yet. So, so what do we do with these companies, you know, like Facebook, like Google, right? Yeah, yeah. It is. So, so coming from the world of of cybersecurity, I would have to say that you know I, I apply kind of the same same principles. I think I, I see some some of my friends from uh, the cyber world on the call right now too. We have been there, done that, right? Cybersecurity was a dirty word ten years ago. Like we were the there was dev DevOps and then dot 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 cybersecurity, where right? nobody wanted us. We were just like, please, you know, try to make your systems. We were we were putting security on top of you know built the systems that we built, and so I think you know what you're mentioning about Facebook it's it's like that you know those those ethics it's things are people are developing things and then there's dot dot dot, dot of, of diversity and ethics and maintaining you know so so it, it will have to come to the you know ML ops will change into something like ML ethics ops you know or something like that so yeah yeah that's going to be that will just it's, it's a cultural change we need to get there hopefully we'll get there much faster than we did for cybersecurity.
<laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that, I think that's the most exciting thing about is us being in this period now, you know, it, it feels like, okay, the culture is changing because more and more people are educating themselves about AI and, you know, the colonel was right, you know, the more we have groups like, like ours that are bringing people together from all sorts of backgrounds, like I was looking at, you know, some of the people that are on today and I, I was just trying to see like what, what, um, you know, what areas are they coming from and I see quite a, quite a, a nice variety. So that gives me hope really, you know. I think um, having more leaders, especially female leaders, right? Because this is an industry that is like basically 80% male, you know, so already right off the bat, uh, you know, increasing participation from all groups is really already a huge benefit. Uh, but it feels like we're building a lot of the, um, I guess, standards of what's going to be acceptable in five years, you know? So, um, so yeah, I guess a, a last question for you then would be, um, you know, what advice, I mean, do you have for, for people that are in the field? You know, I, I think the imposter syndrome come up so, uh, comes up a lot for people because they're like, oh, AI, it's so math heavy. Oh, AI, I'm going to have to learn all this code. You know, so what advice do you have, I guess, for people that are trying to come into the field that are interested, right? Because it is so cool. I mean, what is cooler than like figuring out how we're going to use AI in 10 years? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is such a wonderful question. I, I, and I get a lot of, I mean, I, I mentor a lot of STEM students and they, they ask me that too, that oh, I want to get into AI. And, uh, and a lot of our engineers, you know, reach out to me and say, how do I get into AI? And I think AI is really, um, there, there is that misconception that you have to have be, be that comp sci uh, person and you need to have, you know, um, like just know exactly how neural nets work and everything. And, 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 and I think it really is, is, is a call to all domains, you know, so, so whatever your specialty is, stick with it. But then learn, you know, what are the capabilities? It's, it's, it's just a tool, just like, you know, we learn to use, you know, PowerPoint or Excel. Like, you know, it, it, it's something that you'll need to apply, but you'll have to apply it ethically to your product, which may have had its biases to begin with, you know? So, so I would say that, you know, just build on to the passion that you were already, you know, pursuing. So you don't have to switch and then learn, learn this, this thing, but you, you definitely learn about it because it's definitely the, the way of the not to the present, you know, if you're just saying it future is, 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 is an over, you know, we're, we're too late, but, um, but yeah, yeah, I think, you know, embrace what your passion is and, and uh, apply AI to it with, uh, with ethics in mind. Yeah, and I totally echo that, you know, I, I was a person that, you know, I held the people facing roles, you know, I was always the account manager, the the salesperson, the, um, the, the face kind of of the company, you know, and I always thought, oh, I can't get into that, but I was always so interested in it. And then years ago, I finally did. And I'm like, oh, my God, like, like, of course, we need more people that have my background, you know, exactly. to I've talked to fashion designers, I've talked, to, I'm like, oh my gosh, you, you do you, just you <laughs> make a design like you can, you know, but I'll teach you how you can put simple algorithms, like, that's the easy part, you know, what you do you from your domain. <laughs> and more and more people are going to be touching AI in, in years, in the years to come, you know, whether you're in a technical role or not, it's going to be impacting your life. So the more everyone knows about it, the better, really. Exactly. Thank you so much, Madiha. Such a pleasure. I figured let's have a couple question, uh, minutes for questions, Pamela, whatever you think is best. I know um, there was another question in the, in the chat, if, if we have it. OK, I think the question in chat has been addressed by the Colonel. So um, we are coming to the end of the session. It's our first session. Yay! Thank you, ladies, um, both ladies from the group who are on the call and who are the support role and we will see more of them in the next sessions and the ongoing sessions. So um, I'd like to thank everyone again for taking this beautiful Saturday afternoon and sp uh, spending it with us. This is a area that requires a lot of attention. It is a multidisciplinary approach that is required. So it is no one size or one kind of a uh, approach that will hold the answers. As we pose questions, we need people not only to pose, uh, uh, get answers, but also to pose questions. So with that, I'd like to invite you to join our group. Um, there are two ways of joining. You can either join as an attendee, you know, as a participant who gets notified about our events, et cetera. But there's also a category for joining us as an ambassador which means that you want to take the message and you want to resonate it out into the community. So we 
we are looking for both. And um, last but not least, we were um, we have changed our name to Advancing Trust in AI because, like I said in the kernel, uh, you cannot clap with one hand, right? <laughs> then it's not a clap. <laughs> uh, we need we need men and women. We need um, across the board participation because the kind of questions we want to raise and highlight attention to are not focused on a particular area, which is a problem. This is not about focused on women, for example, focused on diversity. It is one of the areas we want to address, but this is a much larger conversation and we invite everyone to join us. So with that, I'd like to end the call and the session and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you all so much. Take care. Thank you.